Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Esri GeoDev webinar series. About two years ago, we started this series as a way to continue engaging in developer-related topics and discussions in between Esri Dev Summit events. We have a lot of new topics, advanced features, and additional functionality to share with you over the coming months. So be sure to stay connected with us through our GeoDev webinar series page on go.esri.com slash geodev or any of our social media accounts at Esri GeoDev. We would love to have conversations like these taking place throughout the year, so that when we do meet at one of these Dev Summit conferences, it will be as though we never stopped. We hope you get as much or more out of this webinar than you anticipated. Now, we would like to introduce you to today's webinar, ArcGIS REST.js, Portal and Server API. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something like th that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select Use Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So I would like to now introduce you to Dave Bowman, lead developer of ArcGIS Hub, and Tom Wason, developer of ArcGIS Hub. Dave, let's get started, shall we? Great, thanks a lot. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about ArcGIS REST.js. Let's talk, dive in and figure out what this is all about. So this is a set of uh, JavaScript packages that are really oriented around um, abstracting the details of making calls to both the portal, so ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise, those APIs, as well as the hosted feature server and um, on-premise feature server APIs. So generally, these packages are gonna do a number of things for you. Like, why would you use this, right? It's just a REST API, you can construct the request yourself, but this is gonna help handle a bunch of things that kind of are a little bit sticky. It's gonna handle authentication, so it'll uh, be able to kick off an OAuth process and complete it. It handles server federation, token negotiation, handles a variety of encoding things that are sometimes trip people up in terms of how you send um, dates and how you receive the dates back and objects, as well as query parameter encoding. We also uh, hide or, or abstract some of the various ways that these APIs uh, return error codes. We do that in a more um, JavaScript friendly way. This project really started from a bunch of code that we wrote um, as part of the ArcGIS Hub project. So we wrote a whole bunch of uh, low-level wrappers for these APIs, but we wrote them in such a way that they were um, really kind of distinct to the Hub and the Ember ecosystem. We talked with more people around Esri and they really liked the idea of having this, um, but they wanted it not to be part of an Ember ecosystem. They wanted a generic ecosystem. And uh, even us on our own team, we wanted to make sure that the same style of programming would be available for us in either Node or in the browser. And I've noted modern browsers here, but this will work back at least to IE 10, so long as you have a promise and a fetch uh, polyfill involved. And you may be able to use it even back further, I'm not sure. We also had this goal of making sure that this library could be used in an a la carte way to uh, provide very lightweight builds um, for you and work with build systems. It is completely uh, framework agnostic. We don't require jQuery or Dojo or Lodash or anything else. This is a vanilla JavaScript library. It happens to be written in TypeScript, but uh, the build output of TypeScript is just JavaScript. Again, we spackle over a bunch of API idiosyncrasies. Um, if you've ever worked directly with the sharing API, that can be confusing. So we have logic inside of this package to make that a lot more straightforward. And then it aligns with a broader JavaScript ecosystem. Um, it's really designed in such a way that you can uh, use it just directly off the CDN, or if you are using um, you know, a build process, you're gonna get a lot of optimized uh, things out of it uh, if you're using it in that context. Talking about how it compares to other uh, API packages from Esri, 
This is somewhat analogous to the ArcGIS API for Python. Um, it's a little bit less about geoprocessing type stuff, but it definitely has the same ideas in terms of working with the primitives that are in your portal, um, as well as feature services and things like that. It is completely different from the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Uh, the first thing that you will notice is, of course, there's no map, right? In the name, uh, we put ArcGIS, REST, JS, right? This is about dealing with the REST APIs. So no maps, no components, no visual elements at all. The other major difference is this is an open source project. Um, it's on GitHub um, in the Esri organization, not surprisingly, at ArcGIS-REST-JS. Just wanted to take a quick second to look at the repository. Um, at this point, this is used in um, 65 different projects, uh, have dependencies on these packages, and we have over 51 forks. And so most of the time, if you're outside of Esri, um, the way that you contribute back to this repository is you create a fork, um, you do your work in that fork, and then you create a pull request back into this repository. So we have something on the order of 50 people outside of Esri who've contributed uh, back to this project already. This is all by way of saying that um, although <clears throat> these packages cover something like 90 plus percent of the ArcGIS portal API um, and almost all of the feature service API, if there happens to be something that you need that doesn't exist, by all means, um, go over to the repository, file an issue, asking about it, or even better, open a pull request. Um, if you start poking around this uh, library, you'll see that to a very large extent, most of the functions are very simple. Um, we've bundled up all the logic around making the requests and handling the tokens. Um, so that's all centralized for you. But for the most part, new functions or new areas of the API that need to get created they only end up being eight to 10 lines to make that uh, request because it tends to be just construct the URL and then call the, um, use the request library to make it. The structure of the repository, um, you'll notice that um, there's a root level folder called packages. This would be indicative of what's called a mono repo. And so what that allows us to do is have multiple packages um, that get distributed through NPM inside of a single repository and then using some other um, tooling it allows us to automate act actions across all of these repositories so you'll see um, right in the middle we, um, the last uh, commits on a bunch of these folders are from the version 2.6.1 released um, so that's we're able to do that all automatically because of the tooling that comes with uh, the packaging systems so that's pretty cool the packages themselves that you're actually be working with are broken out into request, which is a, you would kind of guess, knows how to make requests and parse um, the response codes from the server and pass that forward. The auth package, which knows how to do OAuth, um, both um, forcing an OAuth system with pop-ups or um, literally just handling the token and uh, username and password, exchanging that for tokens, as well as doing federation. Portal package includes everything you need to create users, organizations, um, or edit your organizations, create groups, share items, et cetera, et cetera. We have more functional packages for routing and geocoding. The feature layer package allows you to create, edit, delete uh, rows in both uh, feature layers and uh, hosted tables, and that will work against your local RKS servers or hosted services. And then the service admin, this allows you to create services, um, add um, rows to them, create views, so on and so forth. As for documentation, um, it's pretty cool. It's web hosted. Um, it's on the GH pages that are associated with the same repo. So that's Esri, GitHub, .io, RGS, REST, JS. This is uh, all auto-generated stuff. <clears throat> um, so it's pretty cool. I'll show how that works uh, in just a second here. But uh, effectively, what we have is on the left-hand side is a list of packages. Under that, we have a whole set of functions. Um, and that's basically the granularity of this package. And I'll get into the, the philosophy around that in a few minutes here. But once you actually pick a function, then you'll see we have um, the description of it. Usually, there's an example. We'll have a link into the ArcGIS, the um, REST documentation, so what's going on at the API level. 
Below that, we have a big section of what are the parameters that this thing actually needs. Um, and if those parameters include uh, interfaces, then we actually have the interface documentation put right there. So this makes it much uh, easier and cleaner to work with this stuff. You know exactly what you need to pass in on all these functions. At the bottom of any of these documentation pages will be a link directly into the source code. And I wanted to uh, highlight that because A, it's open source, um, and you can see that you know, this uh, code here, get item, is relatively straightforward. It's constructing a URL and creating <clears throat> um, some request options, and then it calls request. So any, in adding new functions is relatively straightforward. This top block highlighted in red is just showing that um, the actual documentation is generated directly out of this source code. So um, if you do make pull requests, you may get comments back saying, hey, can you put a little bit more documentation in the code? And it's really just these sort of comments that, that uh, make its way all the way through. Also inside the documentation is a um, section on what we call the guides. Uh, this is an area where, you know, if you like this project and you're excited, uh, maybe there's nothing that you necessarily need, but you've been using it a little bit. We'd really like it if anybody can contribute um, to the guides section. There's stuff that's already here. Um, we hope to be getting more resources dedicated to building out um, more of this internally, but until then, you know, if you uh, have a good example about how to do this with uh, AMD and Dojo, that'd be rad if you could contribute it. Super easy to do. Again, you open a pull request, it's a markdown file, and it will get auto built into this uh, henceforth and forevermore. In terms of reliability, we wanted to make sure that this is a really, really robust library because many groups at Esri rely on this. So in order to get a pull request merged into master, um, the uh, tooling in this repository will automatically run unit tests and it demands 100% code coverage. Sometimes that can seem a little onerous when you just want to add a little feature to something, but the upside is that everybody wins because we know that this is a very, very, very robust uh, project. So that's something to keep in mind, um, super tested. When you actually use these um, packages, when you install them, npm install or yarn install, you'll, you'll get ES6 uh, modules. So this is if you are using a project uh, that has a build system, um, you would be able to just directly import those. Uh, if you're working with require, there's a UMD build. Um, and then if you're working with node and you don't have a, a compile step in that, there are common JS um, modules shipped as well. As I said, this is used in production. Uh, not surprisingly, ArcGIS Hub uh, virtually everything in ArcGIS Hub, whenever we talk to ArcGIS Online um, or the uh, portal instance in the case of ArcGIS Enterprise Sites, which is the same code base, all of that goes through uh, this library. The new version of Story Maps um, and Experience Builder rely heavily on this. ArcGIS Urban um, is also relying on this to some extent. The ArcGIS Solutions project, and this is something that's coming out, I think it's gonna be announced around Dev Summit and then fully released um, at the UC. That stuff is based on this. We also see our professional services teams using this a lot to build really high performance mobile applications that aren't map centric. We have international partners, and as well startups um, are, are gravitating towards this. If you already have an existing application and you need to uh, integrate that into the Esri ecosystem, this is a really good library for doing that. It's very straightforward. Again, it follows all the normal conventions that you would um, if you're building your, your uh, application on like REST or uh, Vue or Angular or whatever framework. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the philosophy because this is going to kind of um, bleed into your experience using this um, these set of modules kind of mentioned this, right? We wanted to be able to optimize for mobile first. And we wanted to design this library in such a way that um, if you use this library, you're going to have the opportunities to get the smallest possible build, right? Because when you're talking about a mobile environment, there are two main things that impact um, the performance. The first is the size of the payload, like the, the smaller the amount of stuff that has to transit the network, the better. And then the second one that many people forget about is that um, the number of requests um, can also dramatically impact performance because the latency on a mobile network tends to be almost as long as the network transit time. So you wanna have 
the smallest number of payloads and you want those payloads to be as small as possible. So let's look at these package sizes. Um, so, you know, these are, these are very, very small, 2.8K to handle a request, everything to do with authentication and server federation, 3.4K, everything to do with managing a portal instance, 5K, right? Super small, super lightweight. When we get into some of these functional things, routing, we start talking about package sizes in the number of bytes, uh, service admin, 750 bytes of actual um, stuff. This common library is super small. It's actually the types. Um, but in your worst case scenario, right, if you simply included absolutely everything, your package size would go up by just under 15 kilobytes. But I said worst case. Um, and that's very specific because if you have a build system using Webpack or Rollup, you can actually get a much, much smaller output. And I wanted to talk about how that works. Now, the top level thing I would say here is that we took a functional programming approach, and that's what's enabling us to do that. I gave a talk at the Dev Summit. It's available on YouTube, all about functional programming and background in that. But in the context of the few minutes I have to talk about it here, what I wanted to highlight is the difference between a functional approach and an object-oriented approach and why we chose one versus the other. So let's talk a little bit about objects and what would be the difference here. Um, what if we started and said, okay, hey, let's build this from the ground up and say, start from a portal class. Now, this is kind of nice. This is the sort of code you'd end up writing. And if you've worked with the RTS uh, Python APIs, it would kind of look like this, right? Import portal from something RTS portal, create a new instance, call the search method on it, get a bunch of results back. Those results would be instances of item objects and you know, you work with that like that. And to a very large degree from a developer perspective, that's pretty rad, right? It's really fluid, everything is, is there, the objects you get back, you can call methods on them. And that's a really friendly developer environment, I think. Now, it does have some downsides, right? And the downside is, of course, that that portal class is going to have more than search. It's going to have stuff like create item, delete item, create group, share to group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are literally going to be hundreds of methods on that portal class. And so if we looked at it kind of visually, right, you have a portal class, it has a constructor, and, and then it has a bunch of methods on it. And those methods, right, many times, those methods are going to return instances of other objects. And so if we just take the portal uh, information model, right, where we have users and search and items and groups and organizations, and, and these things are all cross-related. So if you have a user, then, you, you know, that user is obviously going to own some items, and those items are going to have groups associated with them. And this stuff gets pretty tightly coupled. Um, and that's uh, great. And it's not a problem if the application you're building needs to use all or most of these methods. So if we're building like the RTIS home application, right, the actual UI that manages everything in your portal instance, this would be fine. This is a fine approach. However, if you are writing an application that just needs a few of those methods, you're kind of out of luck. And, and it really boils down to the fact that doing static analysis against a set of um, a bunch of code that's written using classes, it's really, really difficult to programmatically figure out what you're not, what is not being used. <clears throat> so this is a common problem with object-oriented um, class frameworks, right? The idea that if you just want to pick and choose some parts of it, it's very difficult to do that. Now, um, and this is a really cool quote from this guy, Joel Armstrong, who wrote a book called Coders at Work. And if you uh, are a developer full time, this is the thing that you do, I'd recommend checking out this book. But he, he couched this problem as being the banana gorilla problem and in terms of reuse. So you want the banana, which in this case is that search method. But you end up getting the gorilla, which is the portal class. Um, and then you also get the rest of the jungle, which is all the rest of the classes that are all tightly coupled together. And so that's kind of the, the downside of, of taking that object-oriented approach um, if you want to have the ability to um, do highly optimized builds. In contrast, let's talk about functions. Um, functions are just that, right? They're, they're functions. They're all independent functions. Um, 
And what this allows is it's very straightforward um, to trace through what your application really needs. So if you were building a simple app that used search items and remove items from the portal uh, package, that's pretty straightforward, right? Um, it's easy for a static analysis uh, to go through and figure out how to pull in these functions and then any functions they depend on. And so this is stuff that's implemented today in Webpack and Rollup. Um, it's called variously tree shaking, dead code removal, so on and so forth. But essentially it's a way that your build system is able to include only the functions that are actually used. And so this is what I mean by your worst case scenario, you're pulling in 14.7 kilobytes, but realistically, if you have a build system, you can get it down to a lot more. And Tom's gonna show an example of that. We also wanted to point out that if this functional programming style is just a little too much for you and you really, really wanted to have some objects, um, we would be totally cool with that. Again, right, it's an open source project, um, you can go ahead and compose some classes, and, and we'd actually really like this. It would be a super rad thing for someone to do, um, is to take the low-lying functional API that we have today and use that to compose up a set of classes. And if you do decide that this would be something you're interested in tackling, um, there's this good book by Eric Elliott called Composing Software. I literally recommend anybody read this because it's all about uh, functional programming. And then, interestingly, he also has a number of chapters on using a pattern called object composition to take those lower level functional primitives and wrap them up into class instances. Because I think at the end of the day, it would be really cool if this project had a, a library that you could install that gives you that. So if you are building really comprehensive applications, you have that as an option. So from here, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom, who's now gonna give us a bunch of different um, demos about this stuff. So let's see if we can transition over to Tom. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start with a demo here um, that uh, actually comes from the, it's a port, a REST.js port of a ArcGIS for JavaScript API sample. Um, but before I, I do, I do want to talk about just kind of this relationship between REST.js and ArcGIS API. You probably, Dave sort of alluded to it, um, but just wanted to, to to visualize it, here's the Venn diagram of functionality. So there's this area where they have a lot in common, right? You, they both have ways to query portal, do geocoding, uh, query feature services, and of course they need the underlying auth and request. The uh, JS API is gonna have a lot more functionality, stuff that, as Dave said, we are never going to build. Things for visualizing spatial data, maps, geometry engine, widget libraries. There's also a little bit, I think, that is not in the JS API that maybe in REST.js, the service admin, but for the most part, conceptually, you can think of it as sort of, that the REST.js is a subset of what you have in the uh, ArcGIS API for JavaScript. And what's great about this demo that I'm gonna show, this sample, is that it lives, the whole functionality of the sample is contained within that area of overlap. So this is the, the sample page on the, on the uh, JS API website. The sample is accessing ArcGIS Online items using OAuth. So it's the purpose of this is to, to show uh, how you do OAuth and work with Portal. And best way to describe what it does is just to view it. If you're not signed in, you don't see anything. Click the sign in page. Sign in, you're going to see all your items. Very simple. Um, sign out see the thumbnails for them. That's the whole sample, that's all it does. Uh, here is a uh, version that's implemented with REST.js. It is functionally exactly the same. Should have had this all. Oh my gosh, pardon me. So it looks exactly the same. Um, so functionally that we're gonna see there's not many differences with, if we wanted to look at the diff in the code, um, we're not gonna go through this line by line, but obviously, you know, instead of pulling in the ArcGIS API for JavaScript from the CDN, 
over here, we're pulling in the REST.js libraries from the CDN. And, you know, in terms of JavaScript, you're writing just about the same amount of JavaScript. It's just uh, sort of the main difference you'll notice is it's stylistically a little different, right? Like over here on this side, on the left, you're doing a lot more new class, you know, and over here on the right, you're sort of passing pages around between functions. So if the whole, you know, this wouldn't be a good reason to write these libraries just to have this functional style difference. Really to, to see the, you know, why we've done this, you need to go and look in the network tab. And we reload it and we're filtered on JavaScript. We say that the Arches API brings in 265 kilobytes of JavaScript just to run this sample. And if we reload this one, oops, open the network tab, reload it, we've seen that we've brought in about 11. And I'm not doing this to, to, to bag on the Arches API for JavaScript. Obviously, it does a lot more and it has offers a lot more functionality. But if your application kind of, your web application exists just in this area here and is only doing this kind of functionality, it might be a better fit to use REST.js. Now, I suspect that for a lot of you, you're doing a lot more than just what's here in the REST.js part of this diagram. And so you may be wondering, you know, how, what, what does REST.js offer you? And actually there's a very, uh, there's a pattern and there's a reason why all of those products that they've mentioned are using it. There's a, there's a very powerful pattern, which is you might want to do some things, have some interaction with the platform up front, like require users to sign in or fetch uh, an item that has the configuration for your application or uh, work with server. Um, to, to do some kind of operations before you show a map. And this is kind of this ideal scenario this, um, that where you would wanna use REST.js in a web application. And this is when the map or the 3D scene, this, that sort of the things you would use the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, you, they come later in your application's lifecycle. And you really get the best of both worlds. You get a fast initial load, and then you get the full power of the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Now, if you're wondering how you might lazy load and bring the ArcGIS API for JavaScript in, you can use Esri Loader, which is a library, or the uh, Webpack plugin for building the ArcGIS API into your application. Both of those will support that. That's kind of a topic of another talk, but um, you can go look at those libraries and check those out. So I, this pattern is so powerful and important, I want to spend some time sort of diving deeper into the parts of it. We're going to start with um, authentication. And uh, you're probably familiar, the ArcGIS platform has many ways to do authentication in the web. And REST.js, in theory, should work with all of them, although you're going to find that most uh, applications are using OAuth. And there's a few reasons for this. For one, it's, it's built into Portal. And a lot of what we do with REST.js has to do with um, working with a portal API. If you are working with a server API, as Dave mentioned, we have full support for federation. We have a lot of uh, great built-in stuff to handle federated uh, servers that are federated to a portal. But another sort of subtle thing you might not think about is that OAuth has its own sort of UI, that sort of dialogue that's popped up there. All of that is actually just a a web page that's rendered on in you know on another server in the portal and this you know library that we're writing is just pure javascript we don't as dave said we don't have any dependencies on any ui libraries we don't have any opinions on that we don't want to impose those on you so token is going to require some way for you to collect the username and password from a user um, and we're not going to build anything like this for you um, just because we don't want to impose any opinions on you but you can, um, you know, we support for token auth. We have all the underlying, everything under the hood is there for you. Um, it's just, you got to sort of bring your own UI library. So there is a folder in the repository called demos. And there are a lot of demos there, not just the browser demos, but also node demos, different frameworks, all kinds of great stuff is under there to give you um, more than just the, what you would see in the uh, more full featured um, idea of how this works. There's an OAuth 2 browser demo. I'm not going to look at it. It's very similar to what we just looked at um, just, just now. So 
you can go check that out yourself. We always get questions about, does it work with any of the acronym types of auth, right? HTTP, uh, IWA, PKI, all that sort of stuff. Short answer is maybe, sure. I mean, in theory it should. Um, a lot of that stuff happens at sort of a, a lower level than the JavaScript running in your browser. And the we do the REST.js does offer you full control over any headers you're going to send, so any credentials related headers that you send. But um, the thing is that those sort of things they can be you know people can do them different. They can be kind of sort of um, you know they may be different in, from environment to environment. And we just can't offer that full level of support. You know, I don't think any of these projects that you've seen that Dave pointed that, that we're using in production, I think we're all using OAuth mostly. So, and we've got good testing around token, but um, you know, we just can't do what the JS API does with every release and have a big battery of, of people go and manually test those different scenarios. And that's okay um, because it's open source. So what we would say for that kind of thing is we encourage you to try it out. And if you don't, uh, if something's not working the way you expect, open an issue and uh, we can talk through it and see, because we do want to support them. It's just, it's not something that we're doing all the time ourselves. So let's kind of dive into the code that you would the, the, that you'd be writing and using when you're doing authentication in the context of a web application, you're gonna be, uh, probably using this user session class. And that's right, I said class. So we're not functional programming purists. We're pragmatic for something like this where it makes sense. We've got to hold some state for the lifetime of the session. We want to use a class. Uh, all the auth related code is in this library called ArcGIS REST auth. It's one of those packages in the mono repo. And user session, you can think of it conceptually under the hood. It's a lot like the JS API's identity manager, if that's something you're familiar with, but um, the API is very different. So we have with the user session, it's you know modeled, you know, corresponds to one credential, whereas identity manager, uh, as its name implies, is going to be managing many credentials. If you think about that historically, the reason for that is identity manager is there to support maps. Maps have multiple layers. Those layers can come from different servers. Those servers can have their own uh, identity stores. Uh, they could come from different departments, different agencies. Hopefully nowadays, uh, maybe within your own agency, those, a few of those servers are at least federated with portals, so you can have a single sign on there. But you kind of always have this case with a map where you need to handle some other, the layer may come from some other place. When you're working with REST.js, you probably don't need to think about this. Most of the time you're working with a single portal or you know, a single service, and hopefully that server is federated with portal. Um, if you do need to handle uh, you know, multiple credentials, you can just use multiple user sessions. This is something we do in the hub. We've got an admin area where they need to impersonate another user. And we just juggle two multiple uh, user session objects. It's not that difficult. Um, also, though, the, the API is intended to, to be extended, extensible, and this is one of the scenarios we imagined. So, you, so uh, we can, you, you know, no one has written this, but you certainly could write something like a session manager that would work kind of like a headless uh, identity manager, something like that. There's an open issue there that's linked to from this slide if you want to take a look at it in the repo. Either way, under the hood, uh, one of the things that you probably want to be aware of and familiar with is that we do this, this handy little thing that whenever there's an authentication error with REST.js, the error is decorated with a method called retry, which lets you, as it implies, retry that same request with a new um, credentials. And so that is useful in scenarios where either the user wasn't logged in and you want to now you know, kick off the OAuth process and have them sign in and retry it. Or if their their credential isn't, you know, useful, like isn't, you know, valid for the thing that they're trying to do and you want to provide a different, um, a different uh, credential at that point. So there's, again, here's another, you know, under that demos folder is, is an example of how to do that. So you can look at it in your own time. Once you have, you know, back to this pattern where you're going to do use REST.js up front and then uh, bring the JS API in later when you need to do some mapping, um, 
you know, I want to talk about some of the specifics about how you sort of manage that handoff. In terms of data, it's pretty straightforward. Anything that you fetch, like items or groups, they all um, will be, you know, just JSON. And most of the classes that you're going to be working with uh, in the JSON API have a from JSON method that allows you to pass the JSON that you've got back from server in and get a new instance of that class. So that, that's the pro tip in terms of handling the data. In terms of handling credentials, it's a little, little more involved, but really not hard at all. Um, the user session class provides a two credential method. And this returns the credential information, the token, the username, that sort of thing, in a format that you can use with Esri, um, Esri's identity manager uh, register token. So the pattern there is you, you know, do something in the application, you click a sign in button, you use, you sign in hit with uh, REST.js, and then later on, once you're loading the map, right before you load the map, you call Esri ID register token session to credential. Uh, it goes both ways in the, I think, rare case where you've started with the JSON API and now you need to hand credentials off to uh, REST.js, we have a from credential that will work with the, you know, the, with the kind of format that you get back from the identity manager to get credential function. There is a, again, a demo under the, uh, under the demos folder in the repo that shows how to do this. That's something you can explore. I want to take a quick moment here to talk about how you work with other frameworks besides the JS API. If you're not using the JS API up front in your application, you probably are using another framework to handle things like um, components and routing and that sort of thing. Um, there's really not much of an integration story here because it's pretty straightforward, which should be a refreshing change if you've ever had to try and integrate the uh, ArcGIS API for JavaScript in a framework, there's some hoops you got to jump into. I mean, it's really three steps. You install whichever libraries that you need and don't install the ones you don't, like if you're not doing geocoding, don't install that. Uh, you import the functions that you're going to use inside your code. And then in the appropriate place for your framework, um, you call those functions. Now, it's that appropriate place for your framework that's going to vary from framework to framework, but the rule of thumb is, Anywhere that your framework tells you you should be using a data fetching library, and that's where you would use the REST.js libraries. It's a little bit uh, different in Ember. Ember has Ember CLI has this concept of an add-on. They typically wrap NPM packages. So, and we use Ember in production in the hub. So we've got a couple of those that you can uh, that are open source you can use. So, uh, portal services, server services for working with services, and then. Uh, Tori provider ArcGIS is a plugin for Ember's Tori authentication system. So those are there. You would just use those instead of npm installing the packages directly. We have, there are a few open source uh, full-fledged applications, example applications that you can that kind of go deeper than what you than the the sort of little samples that are in the demos folder, and um, these are great to check out if you're using a particular framework. Um, the, the view, we have a view one under the demos folder, that's just a port of that OAuth example, but it's using view, and it was contributed by uh, someone from the community, which is really cool. If you want, if you're using view and you want to see how to work with its lifecycle hooks, this is a great place. Every year at Dev Summit, we uh, hold a workshop where we build an application that works with portal and then also shows in, in, in maps and kind of gives a, a you know, just a, a how to do web dev against portal. And typically we've, in previous years, we've built that using Ember and the application that we build together throughout the course of the day, we leave as an open source application for anyone to look at. So that's uh, this Ember, if you wanna see, you know, a more complete Ember application, you can check out this application here. And um, this year we're gonna be doing it with React and uh, so this is a port of that application built in React, and we're going to take a little bit closer look at that right now. So this is the application itself running. The idea is that you search for something, and it's going to search. Um, it's going to search 
the portal for items that you know contain that keyword and it's going to show the, the results here in the table you can page through results and the results are shown on the map and as you page the map is updated so the the purpose of this workshop is to show how to use you know a real framework with routing and um, you know how to manage the state of which page you're on and all that kind of stuff but also work with the platform and maps and all that um, you can also uh, sign in to this application and now the you know um, so we can go here and see oops misspelled that um, we can now see some items that are only you know that are not shared that I have in my account that are not shared so these ones down here if I sign out they're going to go away so um, just to kind of look a little bit at the code, you know, REST.js is responsible for two things in this application. So it's responsible for signing in and you, you know, see we import user, the user session class. And when someone clicks that sign in button, it calls this handler right here. And we just call this begin OAuth2 method. And what's great about that is that whole thing of pop up the window and all that kind of stuff is encapsulated elsewhere. And if it all succeeds, you get a, a hydrated user session. One thing I want to call attention to here is it's up to the application developer how to persist that session. Um, in this case, you know, we're setting, we're storing it in a cookie. So that way someone can sign back. When they come back, they can be signed in um, automatically. And the session class provides a nice little handy serialized function that takes that JSON representation of the session and makes it a string. You can put like in a cookie or local storage. Uh, obviously, the other thing that we do is we search. Uh, so the search route uh, imports search items here. And then there's a lot of React stuff going on here, but the interesting bit is we pull the search terms out of the URL's query string, and then we just call search items with uh, those the you know properties that we pulled out of the query string there. We also pass the session here. So that session that once the users will sign in, so they're either signed in or not. And that's what um, REST.js from that point handles the, you know, it scopes that it appends the token to the request if the session, if there is a session that's passed in. So, and once the results come back, they're just JSON, we set the state with those results and that causes the table and the uh, map to redraw. So, um, you can look at this application in more depth than your, on your own, um, but it's kind of good to have an example like that that gives you the full, you know, uh, a real complete picture of how to do this pattern we've been talking about. I want to shift gears and talk about Node. Um, you probably you may know or not know that you cannot use the ArcGIS API for JavaScript in Node. Um, and for the most part, you don't want to, right? Like a lot of what it does, the bulk of its stuff has to do with creating these interactive dynamic maps or 3D visualizations of spatial data. It doesn't make sense in Node. Um, there is that part of the overlapping part of the Venn diagram, and that's conveniently, that's where REST.js is designed to, you know, those are things you might want to do in Node and conveniently, that's REST.js works in Node, so this is great. Um, before I hand this over to Dave, he's going to talk about, you know, he's more, does more of the node work and hub, but I did want to talk about one particular scenario that's kind of related to, to web app development and node, and that is isomorphic or universal app or server-side rendered applications. This is where you, the JavaScript in your application can run not only in the client and the browser, but also in the server on, in, in node. Um, People do this to on usually on just the first request to the application, so that um, they pre-render the the response and hand it back down to the client. This allows the client to paint it faster, and it's also good for SEO. Um, this is something that people use for like if you put a link to your website in a social media feed, you get this rich sort of card here that has the title. That's all powered by server-side rendered meta tags. Um, in reality, we found and kind of what I find, what I've heard, you know, what you sort of see out there is this is hard to do, even though frameworks are providing turnkey solutions for this. It's, you find there's more exceptions than the rules in this area. But um, I just did want to point out that we do have an example of how to use one of those turnkey solutions, Next.js. Um, 
with REST.js. And if you look at that, it's very, it should look familiar. This is the application we just showed. Uh, here it is, it's running in, it, this is you know a, a Next.js implementation of that same application. Uh, but if you go look for some, you know, some unique term like Buffalo Run Snowmobile Trail, it sounds like fun. And we look at the source of this application, you can see that it's been rendered here. That table is, was actually rendered on the server. And uh, so that just shows that you can use, um, you know, REST.js in if you are trying to tackle this uh, server-side rendering. But with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Dave to uh, do some more um, uh, more traditional uh, examples of traditional node um, uses with REST.js. Okay, cool. Let me just make sure I'm sharing the screen. I think I'm sharing. All right. Uh, yes. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So um, as Tom said, um, I don't know that I necessarily write most of the code or anything in, in terms of hub, uh, but I do write a number of uh, what I call power tools. Um, and this comes from, you know, as a developer, we're building uh, the, the hub application. A lot of what the hub application does is orchestrate other parts of the platform. Um, we create different instances of things, web maps and services and so on and so forth. Um, so as a developer on this team, um, you end up uh, creating a lot of trashed items and services. Um, this is just, you know, um, when we're doing development, not everything goes right uh, the very first time. And so you just, you know, you end up with these online organizations that are just filled with things that, that don't work, right? Um, the, they're the wrong layers or they don't have layers or what have you. And what that means is that over time, um, we need to have a means to um, say, you know, burn it with fire. We need uh, simple ways to go and clean out an organization. And so um, I am going to uh, reference a repo that has some code in it. And this code is, is dangerous code. So I have to say, um, don't use this, right? Um, and I, I'm pretty serious about that. Like, this is um, some code that is very, very sharp and pointy. It will destroy things. Uh, there's no recovery path. If you use this code um, and call support, they're just going to say, you know, sorry, you brought this on yourself. But it's a good example about how to automate things. And if you're working with Portal and you have a bunch of stuff you need to clean out, you can by all means use this um, as an example to extend and make sure you uh, guard it very uh, closely. So I mean, you can do the same thing with Python, right? Um, but nonetheless, I wanted to just put this out there. So this is on GitHub, dbowman org cleaner. And specifically, um, this little example is gonna look at cleaning out surveys. So one of the things we do within the hub is we allow you to very seamlessly create a survey one, two, three uh, survey. Um, it's created um, and made operational instantly without having to go into the survey one, two, three interface. And uh, so all that stuff happens, but during the development of that process, I created thousands of bad uh, surveys and services and folders and such. So let's take a look at what this code actually looks like. Um, it's not very complicated. Um, in this little block right here, I'm pulling in .env. Uh, this is just a simple way to go and use a configuration file to hold credentials, and you don't check the configuration file into GitHub, or you'll be hacked, right? So don't do that. Always use something like .env. And when you're using um, uh, REST.js within Node, you need to pull in uh, a fetch polyfill and a form data polyfill. And so you just need to require those two in. Again, this is just straight up node. I'm not using any sort of a build system. So, um, you know, this isn't uh, ES6 by default, it's ES5. So then you're able to just require in, it's using the common JS modules, right? A user session, um, pull in the request um, and a bunch of the methods that I want to use. And then I have some other stuff here. I pull in functional helpers out of another library we have. From there, we just really set up this request options, um, which is gonna go and read our username and password out of our env file, as well as what portal we're targeting. Um, because we work with a variety of different portals. We have dev and QA environments. Sometimes we're doing, working against production. And then we have actual portal instances. So we need to be able to configure that. 
And then you just call a function like you would in any other node command line script. In terms of looking at what that function looks like, this is very normal promise-based programming. Um, there's nothing really special about this, right? We call get self, which just goes and gets your portal information. We use that, and then we call remove forms. When that's done, we call the next thing. It's just a promise chain. It's exactly the same way that you would write code in a browser. Um, super straightforward. Looking at one of those little functions that actually does some work here, this thing simply um, executes a query, creates a query string, calls search items, and then um, takes the JSON that it gets back and maps those over a function called delete form. So again, this is, you know, you just write node the way you would have written node before, but now you have a really uh, pretty straightforward, clean way to go ahead and interface with the platform itself. And so that was the total of stuff that we have for today. Um, there, we're ready to take some questions if there are any, and these are the two main URLs you need, the GitHub repo, um, and then right at the top of the repo is the link to the documentation, which is the second URL. Sounds good, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dave and Tom. Okay, so we're now going to begin answering the questions uh, submitted during today's presentation. Uh, we've received uh, one so far, uh, and we'll get through that one, but just uh, and whatever we don't get to today, we will address in a GeoNet blog post after this webinar. As a reminder, you can still submit questions uh, through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. So the question I have is for Tom. Uh, do you have a sample of the second login screen that you showed, the cleaner one? Or is that on these uh, in these GitHub uh, repo that you just listed here? Sorry, the the, the cleaner one. Yeah, it, yeah, it's listed as uh, the quote cleaner uh, login screen. Does that make sense? Or the second login screen that you showed? Uh, low, low, like I suppose. Do they mean like pop up as opposed to doing a redirect? Not, not, not sure. But um, so far as the, the the stuff that you showed, is it is it all at this um, this GitHub repo as, as listed? Yeah, yeah. So the the OAuth example in the repo, uh, there's buttons for both. You can you can do both. You can do pop up, and you can do a you can do the the full redirect one, which is what I showed there. Um, oh, oh, I I see. Um, maybe maybe they're talking about um, the the sign-in dialog, like um, there are, there we don't have any demos doing a sign-in dialog, but there's really uh, if you're using token authentication, the API <clears throat> looks a lot like just what Dave did there. Instead of saying begin OAuth, you just create a new user session and you put the username and password there. And just in the context of a web application, you know the only way to to get a username and password is from a dialog like this. So, um, you know we don't we haven't written any you know, dialogues because it could be in any framework and, you know, you get in, you start getting into validation of things like that and all this other stuff. So, um, you know, okay. it's not, not hard to do. It's uh, a little hard to do well, and uh, it's just going to vary from application to application. All right. Yeah. Uh, I got another oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Question. <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, hopefully I'm answering that question. If not, people can can ask on, you know, clarify on GeoNet and or ping me on Twitter for further yeah, clarification. Or, or just or just add it to the to the question pane right here. I'm I'm looking at it if they have clarification. Um and then I, I just got another one. Uh the question is OAuth. It opens the one from portal, right? I think he means the login pop-up from portal. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, the 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 code for that I, I showed the the pop up portal one is I showed the code for that in the React app, and of course the demos in the repo has both. Yeah. So this, if you're doing OAuth against the platform, this is the way to do it: is to actually open a window that goes to the sharing OAuth authorized endpoint. Um, although, you know, you can go ahead and just pop a form that asks for a username and password, 
most people won't trust that because it's not, you know, the www.rtis.com, right? You could be effectively stealing their username and password. So standard way to do it is to open, uh, you know, pop a window to go to this location. You can handle that yourself or you can just call begin OAuth using the REST.js API. And when you're in a browser, it will do window.open and open this thing up for you. So either way you want to do it, um, we do it in the hub. We handle it ourselves because there's a bunch more uh, parameters that we need to send um, that is very specific to what we're doing with the hub and community logins and so on and so forth. But if you don't have that requirement, you just need your users to sign in, uh, you can pop this up. And um, this, uh, at, its, at its lowest level, the um, REST.js uh, API can handle whatever type of uh, authentication scheme that you're using with enterprise um, because enterprise sites is based upon this stuff too. So um, you can certainly do it. You may have to write some additional code to uh, dance around some things, but it's definitely, it works. Um, yeah, the, the only other thing I'll say is I did not show the code in the redirect page. So when the way this dialogue works is it's it's it, that runs on there um, on the on the portal server. And then once the user successfully authenticated, it redirects to a page. It's got the token in the URL and that's also in the repo. Um, you know, there's a little bit of code that you do there. Um, that you know, I just didn't show in this, but it's it's in the repo. It's all it's in all of the example apps. That it's there for you to see. Okay, yeah, I got a clarification on that with the the cleaner one. He says um, uh, that he's building uh, in Web App Builder uh, with and using JavaScript. And he doesn't like the standard login dialog that's built with Claro. So that's why uh, he's asking about the. Yeah, right, right, right. And that gets in. So I now I completely understand. So yeah, so uh, I do not. It, the JS API does allow you to uh, override that dialog. So that is something you know you can you can tell the JS API. If you can write your own widget and uh, have it look however you want. And uh, so that you can see. I would suggest looking at the JS the uh, Arctis API for JavaScript documentation. Okay. Um, and I can. If, if that question shows up on June and I can find the direct link to that. But if you look at the pop up, um, I, I, I have to, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Um, you've got another question. Whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and June, um, thanks. Yeah. So follow up. Um, let me see. Is there an automatic way in this API to find broken layers or do you have a suggestion for where to start with something like that? I mean, it's certainly not built in, but um, like this is a low level uh, set of tools that you could use to write a script to do that, um, you know, but it, it would kind of be akin to like, you can use the Python API to write something that would do exactly that, right? Go find all your web maps, go through the web map, go find all the layers, go hit all the servers, make sure that they're up, make sure the server is you know, operating the way you want it to in terms of, is it challenging for authentication? Is the, uh, you know, is the layer visible? So on and so forth. Um, you could do this with Python, you could do it with this library, but you would be the one writing the code to actually do that uh, object traversal and verification. Yeah, and and under my repository, under my GitHub uh, username, I've got a repository that does something similar that uh, looks for um, all the web maps. I think I believe it looks for all the web maps that are in open data groups or something like that. Then it it parses the response of those and then it starts inspecting the layers, not for uh, what type of layer they are uh, not not whether or not the layer is broken but uh whether or not the layers of a certain type is something we needed to do for hub when we were upgrading to js api 4 we needed to look for layers of certain types and find that so uh, i can post a link to that that would maybe be a place to get you started it's a little node script that does that kind of thing all right Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Dave and Tom. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, ArcGIS REST.js Portal and Server API. If you have any other questions, please contact us using the email address in your follow-up email. 
Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you completed that and provided your feedback. We will be providing a recording of this presentation, which will be available within seven to 10 business days, and you can find that on go.esri.com slash geodev. So on behalf of Esri and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.